Are so, they allowed to do that? Well, so now oh. that's what they're trying to do. So basically, they weren't allowed to do it before. So what they're trying to do now is change the manual to to adjust to what they didn't do. Uh, who's over EAC? Like who governs them as an so agency? So HABA Act is what formed the EAC. Yeah. It's what codified the EAC kind of like in law. So, so if they're making rule changes to their handbook to accommodate their what they're doing obviously illegally at this point. If it's not a rule already, it's illegal. Um, who, I mean, every agency has a governing agency for every type, every every or industry at all. So, who who is over? Who does EAC so answer to? Anybody? Congress. Well, okay, exactly. okay. So, so, so the, the president. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. The, pre the president. Them? So the president elects. So you get one Democrat uh, president who will, will elect two commissioners or so two. It's a federal agency. Yeah, and then uh, okay, you, they'll okay, wait until a Republican So we're gets out in. of the state of Arizona now. So we've yeah. moved from the out well, of the state to somebody federally running the EAC, which governs what happens in the states and accreditation um, labs. And let me ask you real quick about those. Do we have to hire accreditation labs in our state or they're somewhere in Kansas or? They're out of state. No, they're oh, out so of state. They're not even, they'll okay. still come in state to perform, I believe they perform the logic and accuracy tests. And how many are there in the that. nation? Are there a lot just of two. these? Just two. Just two. Total. Yeah. Total. For there the used election to be three. side there of accreditation? There used to be three, but now there's are just three. Are you three? Two. No. Okay. <laughs> So, no. oh, because oh, you, you work with electronic devices. So we were going to talk about that later. So he had mentioned FCC and Homeland Security. So this we'll is, talk this about is that where later. the real breach is, and I yeah, think where so the, the heart of the matter is, intricate. is because HAVA was created to protect the people through, uh, let's just say, a very disjointed election system is the sure. way that they explained it. But the EAC is given power through HAVA to administer all the rules. So really, I don't know who they really have to answer to, mm -hmm. because HAVA has a, a, a effectively commissioned this commission, right, to write mm -hmm. the rule book. If the states voluntarily adopt the EAC rules right. and they have a law, and many most states have across the country at different levels of compliance because they're written and they just take them and every just state's do a little it. different. Correct. Okay. Appro approximately half of the country has adopted the portion of HAVA that requires voting system testing labs, which is what we're talking about here, okay. to effectively uh, to, to certify the machines in those states. Huh. Uh, the other states have different ways of getting their machines uh, you know, uh, certified. So this is not just Arizona, so this is across the entire country. So do any states not use that system? Some states do not. So not 100% of all the states are, so are not doable. governed by HAVA. So it's, it's so well, it's, it, the, the it's, important thing, I we think, We can for, do this in Arizona. Other people do it. Don't adopt what they say. That's right. So, okay. so if, to, just to try and boil, boil that down. First of all, this is not an Arizona situation. This is almost a countrywide situation with as many as 30 to 34 states that fall under the same laws. As a result of the machines are not being certified in any state, not just Arizona, in any state, certifiable votes don't occur in all these states right. that follow HAVA. So in effect, those are really nullified. You know? And so these days, what we need to do is have the uh, county supervisors realize it doesn't matter what the Secretary of State says, we cannot use these machines in our action. We've got to go back to the traditional methodologies that people can trust. Because we, like we, we own, we, the people, own the elections. Right. We, the people, paid for the machines. And so we, the people, since the legislator, the attorney generals, the governors, the secretaries of states, even down to the sheriffs, are not doing the things that need to be done to stop this, it's up to the people to stand up, and, and we saw that today in, in uh, Pima County. Pima County, and it's up to the Board of Supervisors. That's why you can get involved by telling your officials that you do not want them to use the machines. It is a subjective rule. They can do away with it yes. um, at the will of the people, but the will of the people has to be known. They're not mind readers, so you sort of have to force your, your opinions upon them, and, which is their job to listen. And speaking of listening to the people, I know, Daniel, you've been in a couple Board of Supervisors meetings lately. Uh, you were over at uh, Pinal today, Pima last week. And um, tell the people, I didn't know this, Paul just told me today, some places have two minutes, some people have th th some counties three minutes allowable for citizens to get up and speak. So tell people what you do at these meetings and then so they know that they how they can also get involved at that level because we want to do some calls to action too it's not about the data it's really about also how you can get involved to make a difference in the next three weeks or five weeks 
Um, so let them know how they can do that. So I, we've basically, I've, we've educated ourselves to the law and understanding of what the law says and how they're supposed to do their job to the law. And then we address that. We only get to, most of the counties it seems average three minutes to speak. Uh, it, it's tough to get what you need to get in that time, but at least we're getting that time. Um, Pima County actually tried to take away some time today um, just to keep us from being able to really speak with our mind and exercise our fundamental right, which is to petition our government. And which if they we're take doing. time away from you, what do they tell you is the reason for that? Well, this was all oh, because too many people are here, and which is, you know, back in the, back in the days, you know, and when our foundation, they would be hours, you know, even debates. days on debates and mm -hmm. stuff before they made decisions. And, uh, you know, that goes into, I'm gonna bounce around a little bit, but that even goes into, we were trying to petition our legislative branch and our Senate. And in the, in the process there, you know, I think fifth process, it's a right for us to petition or remonstrate our you know, government. We did that. They would not put it on the floor. Matter of and fact, is that legal? That's well, the According history. To the of the so, state. so a history in the journal, Arizona Journal, they would read it on the floor. If someone did a petition, they would read the petition on the floor. They didn't do it. They are okay. trying to, I, in my personal opinion, they're trying to keep from the American public what's really going on, and that's them violating our due process, our our Fourteenth Amendment. It, it is a it is a huge thing. Our government really is going against our, our electoral right. due process in this and, and, and our equal protection. And so we've, we've addressed that over and over and over. Now we're, we're going to work on some things and go ahead. Yeah, and I, I think it's important for uh, everyone watching this to understand the lengths that we've gone to do this the right way. Um, we have filed five cases in the Arizona Supreme Court and been turned away on every count. And in, and in our opinion and from uh, Law. People who understand this, uh, it was we were denied uh, due process through reasons that we don't believe the court had a good uh, cause to dismiss our case. We weren't heard. So when uh, you let me, so I just want to, I like to tie things in a little bit because there's a lot of information that floats yeah. out. So for those of you that constantly hear that um, people filed lawsuits and they were dismissed um, for no cause. That is not necessarily the case. There are lawsuits that have been dismissed, but why in some instances were yours dismissed? We'll give an example of our last lawsuit Just we just put in. Uh, one of them was, well, you didn't have, you didn't address it five within the five days after the election. Oh my goodness, what in the world? Five days for us, the people, right. to cover something so complex, but yet our Secretary of State gets two years <laughs> To, but and even in that two years, she couldn't even adhere to the law. You see, right. so that's an electoral due process issue. Now you're taking away our our ability for a remedy. Right. Then they turn around and say, "Well, you didn't have remedy." Well, the remedy was the writ of mandamus. It was that's the remedy. We're asking them to fix this wrong, these violations of the law and the Constitution. And it wasn't even a matter of finding a fact finding. The, the facts were it was government documents which stand as facts and the fact is is the law was violated just law law in the in the in substantive and procedural due process you mentioned that those things were violated and that's the importance of all of this of what we've we've covered and addressed so we're strictly talking about constitutional rights um, afforded to us as citizens of the United States which we still have at, on the books um, in theory and so in relation to that, another thing, I just, I really want to get the information of how people can try to help overcome these things in their little communities when they hear this. Exercise so, it. Exercise their rights. So what would be steps one and two in this particular scenario? You guys are starting this from scratch. You know this is happening. It's been advertised on the news for a year. You guys get involved or for a few months. What was your first what, and second step? Yeah, what I, what I started doing is, as I came in contact with uh, Daniel was to start start reading the Constitution and, and I would get a copy of PDF I would start highlighting these sections and when it would said something like only legal ballots may be counted um, that's an important thing to know uh, that the uh, foundation of the Constitution is we the people in we put in place this Constitution and it's from that Constitution that people like Secretary of States and uh, the voting supervisors gain the ability to work and who are they working for they're working for we us people. and that's been forgotten 
I, and I when you say legal ballots, it also gets, I want to point this out too, it always gets conflated on other shows with legal people, and it's not the same thing. They want to make it about illegals voting. It's not that. It's legal ballots, meaning certified through an accredited agency or lab that has the legal authority um, to make it certified. So we're not talking about people, so let's put that aside. Um, and but, that's I mean, it, it's something like, they it's was not, put together. It's not about trying to make these machines, the voting machines work. It's like I don't see how we can trust the labs to do it. Well, I would agree. Or I'm just saying, but the legally the, the process would be, yeah. I don't agree with that either, but I'm just explaining, it's, it's about the legal process if they were to be a, a legally accredited to be able to certify properly, which they were not. But I just wanted to make the point that when you say legal ballots are counted, everybody always wants to say the illegals. Mm, yeah. You see, they conflate that, and they, they, they off track them to think it's about people that we're talking yeah. about. We're not talking about people at Just all. Votes. Although that's important too, illegal uh, entrances, I call them, are not, shouldn't be voting anyway, that's the law. But we're talking about the ballots themselves and not using the machines, but going back to the old school hand counting, which is always the best way to go, actually. And as somebody who worked the audit, I can attest firsthand that it can easily be, be done. We did in our state and um, uh, 2.789-ish million, I think, ballots that we, we all worked on. So I just wanted, to, that's what I meant, yeah. I don't agree. Obviously these are corrupt agencies and labs and, and the corruption is going through the agencies that promote them as being legitimate. Um, yeah. So it's on both levels that we have the problem up to the federal government with the HAVA issue and the, and the e e EAC. Thank you, EAC. So, where, wh what else can we share where people can understand how? Give me another well, action that they can well, do to get before, involved. The Constitution we, is great. Before by we the way. do that, I'd like to say something Please. specific to Arizona. What, what's important to uh, understand is, is that we've gone to such great lengths to do this the right way. Um, as we've talked about, we we did approach the legislature, and uh, we we had a number of conversations behind closed doors. I uh, spoke to a number of senators and House members, and I want I want everyone to know that we got no help. Yep. Your legislators understand what's happening, and they're doing nothing about it.